My next guest helped the UK out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dame Kate Bingham headed the government's vaccine task force, which in December 2020 secured and distributed the world's first COVID vaccine. Now she's written a book, The Long Shot, all about her experience and she joins us this morning. It's a, an absolute pleasure to meet you, Kate. It, it's an incredible story from start to finish. But if I just may ask what you were doing, what was your job before the pandemic and before we got this incredible text from Matt Hancock, which we'll talk about in just a second. So thank you for having me, uh, Christine. So I'm a venture capitalist, which means I set up and invest in new companies developing medicines to treat patients whose diseases are not well treated by current therapeutics. So I develop drugs for cancer, blindness, autoimmune diseases. And so my whole world is about putting together teams and helping to develop these novel drugs. OK, so the, the, the background was certainly there. And here you were on a Zoom call doing your day to day job and your phone goes and it's a text message from the then health secretary, Matt Hancock, saying, can we talk? And life literally changed from that moment on. I explain to us the next chapter for you. Well, it was a bit surreal. So I speak to Matt Hancock, who says, the, gov the Prime Minister asked me to come in and be chairman of a new vaccine task force, which would be full time to try and secure, pr procure, manufacture and develop vaccines. And my reaction was, well, why me? Because there are so many people who are much greater vaccine experts than me. So I came up with all these reasons why I couldn't do it. And eventually he said to me, Kate, none of us have done this before. We're asking you to step up. And actually, that's a pretty good... Uh, response. So I then said, well, give me some time to think about it and um, I'll come back to you tomorrow. And um, I mean, the answer was I was really, really um, shocked and needed a lot of persuading to do it. But then my husband and my daughter then gave me all the reasons why I should do it. And so overnight, I then said yes. Because you mentioned that in the book, that was, that was part of it, because you thought this is going to take me away from my family. You were already a busy working person and then suddenly... This, uh, it's, it was taken over all of our lives at that point. Yes, although actually my, my worry was more about I just wasn't well equipped to do it. Because mm. uh, you mentioned imposter syndrome. In yeah, the book. and, you know, I think it is a, quite a female characteristic. Mm. When you see something that says chairman of the vaccine task force, you think, well, you have to be a vaccine expert. And I'm not. I'm certainly an expert developing new drugs, but that is different from vaccines. Mm. And so that was what I was latching onto rather than actually in the the scale of you know, and the scope of my capabilities, could I actually do it? Just how tough was it, Kate? The conversations that went on behind closed doors, we at home were watching the news constantly, hanging on every single word that our medical professionals were telling us, our lives changed because of it, our, it, it was life and death for many people. So what was it like being in that inner circle? Well, I'd say there were two aspects of it. The, the real challenge at the beginning and throughout until you know, November was the recognition that no vaccine had ever been developed in less than four years before. And that was 50 years ago when, with the mumps vaccine, when the regulations were much softer than they are now. And that the most advanced vaccine formats, which are the mRNA and the adeno vaccine formats, had never been approved for anything ever. So we were, we were dealing with a position where the chances that this would all fail was pretty high. So I had that sort of stress on one side, but then actually the team worked incredibly well. So one of the things uh, that I asked for and was given was the right to recruit my own team. Mm. And actually being able to work with a group of people who really are experts um, worked incredibly well. So that bit wasn't so stressful. And so I was quite confident that if there were going to be good vaccines out there that could be both safe and effective, that we would find them. Mm -hmm. The question was, would there be any vaccines at all? And Thankfully, there was, Kate, and it was a, a monumental shift in, in the pandemic and how we were, again, how we were living our lives. Um, an extraordinary moment when we all saw that first person having the vaccine in their arm. How did you feel at that point, knowing everything that had passed and, and the torment that so many families had been through? That was an incredible moment for everybody. I mean, just hugely relieved, but actually my relief was about a month or so before because the biggest um, excitement for me was that first data showing that the Pfizer vaccine was 95% effective. Mm. So once we saw that, 
then we knew that we, it was just likely to be a matter of time before we got the regulatory approval and then we could start getting vaccines in arms. And, of course, there were some hiccups getting the vaccine into the UK, which mm -hmm. you can read about in the book. Yeah. But and a huge cost, obviously. There's a lot of money here as well, which you talk about. You know, none of this is cheap. No, but it wasn't that expensive. On average, we were spending a little over £10 a dose for vaccines. So, actually, in the scale of things, not that bad. And actually, it costs more to deliver the vaccine, mm. as in to stick it in arms, yeah. than it did to buy the vaccine. Um, you talk about the great team that you had, and you also did ask to be able to respond directly to the Prime Minister, because there were a lot of other people that needed to be talked to and it held things back and in fact at one point you find Whitehall as being the biggest opponent almost to your work because there's just so much red tape. There is a lot of red tape. What we were able to do though was to basically cut that red tape and shorten it a lot. Mm. So the way we worked was actually consistent with how um, the government normally works. So we were making recommendations. We're, out, we're from the outside, making recommendations. The civil service makes sure that what we're recommending is in a form that is legal and appropriate for government. And then the ministers took the spending decisions. So actually the process was what the process normally is. Mm. It's just we massively compressed the time frame. Yeah. Um, you had obviously several meetings with, with Matt Hancock, the then health secretary, of course. Um, and there was one particular meeting where you sort of came away thinking, feeling frustrated. Is that a nice way to put it? Correct. <laughs> Explain that to us just and, and why it, it came to that. Yeah, so it was a challenging meeting. It was, it was, it's called the COVID-O meeting, so the operations meeting, where he challenged me on two things. One was about who should be getting vaccinated. Um, and at, the po at that point... The advice from the JCVI, which is the expert group that advises the government, was that only basically groups one through nine should be vaccinated. So that's all adults over the age of 50, plus adults under the age of 50, but with severe underlying disease. Um, and he was challenging me on why should a worried 45-year-old not, not get vaccinated? But my job was not to develop vaccination policy. Mm. That's the job of the JCVI. So he shouldn't really have been challenging me, me on that because that's not, nothing to do with me. I asked the JCVI who they wanted to vaccinate and therefore how many vaccines to buy. So that was one challenge. And then the other challenge was the timing to receive um, the AstraZeneca mm. Oxford vaccine. Um, and so actually after we had that uh, little frustrating conversation, actually it then resolved mm. because um, I said this is the position, he recognised it. Um, and, and actually, he was then a, a supporter um, after that. So he was helpful to us. He was helpful. Well, um, we asked the Department of Health for a comment, of course. They, they, they said no comment, which is fine. Um, a spokesperson, interestingly, for, for Matt Hancock, has been in touch. They, they slightly disagreed with the account in the book. They said, Matt is a bit surprised you keep raising this meeting. They go on to say, you'll have to read Matt's book to find out what actually happened. It's the most interesting right of reply I think I've ever had. But, Good. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. Is indeed, but um, it's a very, it's an incredible book, and as you, you're obviously a great advocate of, of get, get the vaccine out there, keep being vaccinated, and hopefully, hopefully, we won't ever return to where we were. I would hope so, and keep um, buying the book because the, all the proceeds go to charity. Absolutely. So we've got educational charities, both early and uh, u university in Hereford. That's wonderful. And um, Kate's new book, The Long Shot, is out now. Thank you so much, Kate.